Welcome back. I have Andy Wacker joining from Canada today, normally of Boulder, Colorado, but uh, today calling in from Canada. Andy, thanks so much for taking some time to chat. You're welcome. It's good to be here. Awesome. Uh, the first question is always a tough one. Who is Andy? Oh, man, that is a hard one. Um, I'm a pro trail runner who lives in Boulder, Colorado. Um, I was a middle school math teacher for the last three years. So that's kind of part of my life. And uh, just someone who's passionate about giving back to the sport of trail running at this point. Cool. Um, well, you're up to some really cool things, and I'm sure we'll get to that. Um, but let's uh, let's dial it back a few years, maybe, maybe to your own middle school experience. But um, do you remember your first run? Um, well, I don't know if this was my first run, but I do remember I was joining my, uh, middle school cross country team and, you know, it was going to happen in like August. And I had talked to, um, like the coach and he was like, yeah, you should like run a little bit before. And my only experience was running the, what's it called? The presidential physical fitness challenge where you just race a mile. So basically for like a week leading up to my first cross country season, I would go over to this road near my house. That was like approximately a mile and I would run it as hard as I could and try to beat my time every day. Nice. And uh, you enjoyed that? Oh yeah, it was fun. So obviously not a good training training technique, but it was, it was fun <laughs> doing that. And um, it was fun being on cross country and never gave it up. And fast forward a few years, you're running a lot of trails um, maybe you've honed in on your approach to training so that you're not just going a hundred percent all the time, but, um, talk to me about the evolution of your running and, and training since then. Yeah. Um, kind of a quick recap would be, um, you know, ran in high school and, and did well. I was, uh, won a couple state titles or something like that. And then, um, ended up running basically as a walk on at the university of Colorado. So that's what brought me to Boulder. Um, there I was a two time all American in cross country and just really liked my experience and made a lot of friends and connections, um, continued running in Boulder, kind of doing all sorts of things, cross country roads, track, you name it. Um, and eventually kind of found my niche, which is kind of balancing my time mostly between a road season in the spring and a, a trail season, um, in the summer, basically. <laughs> And how did you land on that split? And the reason I ask is for the last few years, that's pretty much been what I've done as well. And I really, I really like the balance. Yeah. Um, you know, I think one thing that's really important to me is, um, well, I'm 34 years old. And I think that like a lot of athletes I see, especially who are my age, they just like get sick of running and it's not enjoyable to them anymore. Um, so one thing that's always been important to me is to maybe switch, switch up seasons because I think it keeps it fresh. Um, and I think it just like, it gives you a new goal and a new motivation and, and it really feels right when you're kind of getting sick of doing whatever it is, fast road workouts, then you're able to go jump on a beautiful trail all summer. And then you're right in the winter when you're like, man, the trails are icy and I'm kind of sick of that. I want to just want to run faster and get some of these miles going, then you can switch back. So it's always nice just to have that balance. Yeah. And uh, your focus on the trail side of things is mostly sub ultra. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've run a couple 50 Ks, but um, yeah, I specialize in sub ultra. Do you find any pressure to go longer? particularly in this space of sponsored athletes, people who, you know, there's, if you look at, you know, ultra runner or I guess ultra runner of the year is by definition <laughs> ultra, but the, um, I guess that's the point. Like the, uh, like I, when I got into running, I felt, a I felt compelled to run a marathon because that's what everyone was doing. Um, may, it may or may not have actually been true, but, that's, that was the perception. Do you feel any sort of pressure to run those 50 Ks and, and longer? Um, I think there is some pressure and I know people ask me about it all the time. They're like, Hey, when are you going to run a hundred K or hundred miler? And, um, I'm just pretty comfortable in my own skin and doing my own thing. And I know that what's best for me, um, you know, I'm not excluding that maybe in the future I will, but I really enjoy and have had a lot of su success doing 10 K marathon, um, on the trails and, uh, so I'm just going to keep on doing what I enjoy. Cause I think that's, what's the most important is just loving the process of, of running and training. 
Talk to me about running a 10K on the trails. What, like, I, I don't have enough foot skills to, <laughs> to do such a thing. I spent two months in, in Breckage, um, and then back to Boston, started running trails in Boston. I was like, stupid fit. And I couldn't run trails because I was like too fit to run on new, like, uh, East Coast trails. Hmm. Yeah, well, I guess it like, really depends. Like, I love uh, kind of like the classic mountain running format, which is uh, 10K, where you basically run up a mountain and then run back down as fast as you can. Um, and to kind of speaking to your point, one thing that I always find that that's really funny is when you come off of road season and your foot speed is just ridiculously high, um, you actually like run off the trail because you're going too fast on downhill. Yeah. So you'll be hitting it so fast. It's like really hard to keep it going um, and keep keep that like skill balanced with that speed um but yeah just like the intensity is so high it makes it really interesting i love that um and then on the flip side we we went on a run together um in tahoe and you were introduced as slowest fast runner in boulder in regards to Mm. your easy runs um talk to talk to me about about that yeah that was a good luck run kind of by the way we were uh we were running with my wife and a couple other people, but we were basically, it was the day between the VK at Broken Arrow and the 26K. And we were like walking up a mountain <laughs> and uh, <laughs> turned out well because uh, I ran the VK okay and ran the 26K pretty well. Um, but yeah, I think being the slowest fast runner in Boulder or whatever. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just, I don't think... I, I pr- believe pretty strongly in a training philosophy of like, keep your hard days hard and your easy days easy. And you know, if it's the day before a race and you're going up a big mountain, like who cares if you need to walk, like just keep it fresh and, 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 um, make sure that you're able to recover and feel good for when you do go hard. And, um, so I run a lot of like nine or 10 minute miles or don't, don't even look at the watch. It doesn't matter. So, um, I think it's important just, uh, especially like as a trail runner, like throw out the watch. It doesn't matter. Like, it's, it's important just to, to be out there and doing what you do and, and feel like, feel like you're enjoying it and recovering and on the easy days and then feel like you're pushing it on the hard days. Not a good statement if you're pursuing a government or credit sponsorship, but, uh, oh, yeah, sure. you know. well, I mean, <laughs> don't throw it out. I always wear it, but you don't, don't have to look at it every 10 seconds. I'm kidding. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Yeah. Um, it's, it's fascinating being here and seeing what elites do less so on their hard days because it's like that's impressive but it's even more impressive when they're um uh when they respect the training enough to to slow down on on the easy days and there are olympians pro and so many pro athletes here that you know that i run with on their easy days and it's my hard day and um or or some combination some version of that and it's really cool to see how people sort of find different people to run with in order to um, get the training stimulus that, that they're looking for. Has that always been the case for you that you've, you've respected the easy days, easy, hard days, hard dichotomy? Yeah, I think so. I mean, like um, going to see you, Mark Wartmore is a pretty strong believer in that, but I think I do remember in college we were a lot more, seven minute miles was easy. <laughs> it was like our easy pace. And if you're going flat all the time as a pro road kind of person or track kind of, kind of runner, maybe that makes more sense. But, um, so we'd probably get in trouble if we went slower than seven minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, definitely post collegiately as just what I needed to be able to recover and, and make the next workout happen. Cool. We're going to have to edit the, the Armin and chorus to Suto, by the way, I, I, uh, <laughs> made a mistake on that one. Um, but yeah, that's the, it's, it's so interesting to see how pro athletes have like accepted this dichotomy where amateur athletes, it's something that like, there's a lot of room for improvement. And if you think about it, a, a professional runner running a seven or even a seven or eight minute mile on their easy runs, that's like, it could be two minutes slower than marathon pace or 90 seconds slower than marathon pace. And that's a huge range. <laughs> and, and yeah, it's just like, it's one of the things that, um, I, I made that shift. I used to think, you know, a, a mile was garbage if you didn't run it faster than seven thirty, And 
that's just a recipe for being injured frequently. <laughs> yeah. Um, talk to me about the trail team and where did first, what is it? And, and where did the idea of creating community in this app, um, come from? Sure. So yeah, the trail team is a developmental team that, uh, is going to help sponsor six young athletes who are kind of up and comers in the sport who need mentorship, maybe some financial support, um, so that they can get on the next level. And so it's basically this piece that's missing from what I would say is post collegiate to pro, even though that might not be the case. It might be someone who's not, you know, who's still in college or didn't run in college or didn't go to college. Um, but kind of that age group. So young twenties, um, what, what, what will they be getting out of? Well, what will they be getting out of it? Yeah. So the big things are, um, I think like, so I, I've been thinking about this for years and years. And so I just, uh, I kind of wrote down my list of what I think athletes needed. And then I just spent the last like month reaching out to everybody. I know and a lot of young athletes and asked like, Hey, what do you need? Like, what's the number one thing you need to, to be successful? Um, and so what I heard was, um, what I'm calling mentorship. And so what that looks like is it's like one-on-one time with someone who's an established elite athlete. Um, so think if you're a young woman, who's really good at running track and has run some trails, maybe you want to reach out to Grayson Murphy and you're like, you're someone who's had success at both of those at the pro level. Like, how do you do it? How do you balance that schedule? What does that look like? Cause, um, there's not a lot of, there's almost no coaches that know what that looks, looks like. And there's also not that many example athletes. Um, and so there's not this like re- pre-written roadmap playbook for these young athletes. And I think that mentorship is really important. Um, and then there's, there's several other things. The second thing is training camps. So what that looks like to me is like, let's just get to, together like elite athletes and these six younger athletes and, and learn how to run downhill. You know, like the elite athletes have that experience. How can we pass on that experience? If that's a, um, how to run downhill, how to listen to your body, how to um, do all these things that we've been doing for 10 years, like how can we pass on that knowledge? Um, and then I think, here's kind of a list of other things, but one would be just money to get to races, um, tons of media coverage. Cause that's so important for young and developing athletes to, to grow their brand. Um, and then things like coaching strength training and gear, I think are kind of at the, the bottom of the list, but also important. So are you compiling a, a roster of mentors part of it, or is it sort of like a, let me help you get in touch with these people? Yeah. So right now we kind of have, um, four flagship mentors or whatever you want to call it. And that's going to be Grayson Murphy, Adam Peterman and Ali Mack and myself. Um, so we're kind of the, the names on the, on the team. And that's going to be just put on our Instagram in the next couple of days. Um, and then I have, you know, a whole roster of people who I've talked to and who are um, part of this community that are super willing to help. Um, and I think they're going to help too. So it's going to be, find the team and then really have conversations of who's the best person for you to talk to. Like, who do you want to be in three years or five years? Um, And let's have that, um, that open dialogue where maybe you can call this person once a month and say, here's what's on my mind. Like I'm really having trouble with whatever it is transitioning from um, college or from finding a schedule. Cause I think those are, are what's on people's minds or maybe they're not even thinking about it yet. Like one conversation I just had was with, um, a young woman who's about to graduate from CU and she, she like, didn't even know what questions to ask, I think. And I think that's important. And, um, from my own experience, like I learned so much that first year or two post collegiately where I really had to reach out to people. And I was like, wow, I'm like a freshman again, basically. I have no idea what yeah. I'm doing and I need to, to kind of learn the ropes from the people who do. Super cool. Um, I'm curious on the, the media and sponsorship side of things. So I did a podcast with Finn Melanson on single track and we were talking about sponsorship and, and he made the offer of, you know, any, anyone who's listening to this, who's a up and coming or current pro athlete, like who wants guidance on how to navigate all this message us. And I was like, okay, I'll match that. So we ended up talking to, and, 10 pro athletes about like our advice being the creator or brand side or like working, having worked with sponsors. And 
it was fascinating because I thought we were going to get a bunch of like 22 year old athletes, but it was like half young and new people and half like very established, been in the sport for 10 years. And they're looking for creative next partnerships or like athletes who have uh, an apparel sponsor that's a head to toe setup and they are sort of limited in what they can do. So how do you think outside the box? So it was, it was fascinating exercise to, to help people, but also to hear what the, what the challenges are and how people are, aren't thinking in the space. So I'm curious how much of the, um, mentorship or, or discussion is around like how to stay in the sport financially. And, um, I'd say this and then acknowledge like Grayson in particular is, is really, really good at this. So it's, it's awesome that that she's a part of uh she's a part of the program yeah exactly so i think um you know different pros are good at different things and uh so kind of acknowledging what you're saying like some people like they're an athlete they're really good at being an athlete and right. so like they're not good at being a, a business person they don't have an mba they're not like um a, someone who is like an influencer um, so again, like, I think for the trail team, we're going to reach out to the people, like you're saying, like Grayson, who are good at that, to be able to help with that piece in terms of, um, I'm calling it something like social media 101. Like how can yeah. we, um, help athletes grow their brand? Um, and man, just moving on with that. Like, I think more than social media, or maybe that's a piece of it too, is just like, what are all the forms of media? How can we spread the word about what this is and how, what we're doing? Um, it's meant to be, um, you know, like a nonprofit community building thing. So how can we just make sure that people are aware of it so that they can be part of it and be, um, uh, just like this positive influence in the sport. Um, so we're really looking at doing a lot of photos, videos, maybe some, um, you know, a lot of like Instagram, really short videos or the 30 seconds, but hopefully we're going to reach out with, uh, and if anyone who's listening to this podcast would love to help, please reach out to me. Um, but we're already talking to some people who who do this professionally to to maybe make some longer stories that we're gonna to be able to share with the trail community. So super cool. This uh, this episode is airing the day before Bandera, and I'm I'm nice. testing out sponsorship of Bandera uh, and their media coverage. So hopefully, people who are tuned into Bandera listen or watch this podcast and we have a few extra eyeballs and ears on this uh on this conversation so if you're listening and you've come from the the podcast coverage um welcome uh hope you stick around and uh and definitely reach out to andy if if uh, you're if speaking your language so switching or i actually i don't want to switch gears yet uh, I want to I want to continue on point. So you're 34. You've been in the sport for a while, and you've probably seen this evolution of okay, I'm an athlete. I want to compete. To you know, you look at your Instagram bio, and you have a handful of sponsors that enable this to continue to happen. I'm curious about your own evolution as a runner and as someone who is good at social media and good at connecting with people, and how that's enhanced or if that's enhanced your longevity in the sport and being able to do what you love, which seems to be running. Um, and the, like the balance of social media media and just like hammering beautiful trails. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a balance. Um, I mean, I, I would say people definitely do social media things better than me. Um, I try to share some of my experience. It's easy when um, you race 20, 25 times a year, like I do. So you just take a good picture. Um, man, with longevity in the sport too, there's just been so many challenges to be, to be honest, like battling injuries, battling, trying to um, form new sponsorship deals every year. It's stressful. And it's like, it's not the reason I do what I do. I do what I do because I like it. And, um, if I can share that passion and excitement with others, that's awesome. So, um, but that's more in the background, to be honest, for, for my personal gratification. Um, so yeah, the, the, the media part of it's been interesting. 
yeah, just because it's, uh, it's evolving and changing, I think a lot. Um, but yeah, I think that's, that's, that's definitely something you have to do now. You can't, you can't not be present on social media. Um, as an athlete, it's, it's difficult. Like you kind of, you have to do it and you have to do it somewhat well. <laughs> What's been the, the most surprising change over the, over your use in the sport? Oh man, I'd say for the better, um, trail running is growing like specifically, yeah. Like short distance trail running in the U S is getting massive and it's amazing. Like more people know and are involved in it. Um, I think I just posted this uh, a couple of weeks ago because it was just like one of my biggest takeaways from this year, from 2022, was that like, um, for example, I raced Sears and all in 2017. So that wasn't super long ago, but that was five years ago. Um, Sears and all is a, one of the most popular trail races for those people who don't know for it's about 20 miles long, full shorter than that. Um, insanely competitive and it's had this incredible history for 40 plus years of, of good athletes from all over the world, you know, 40, 50 countries coming in to, to race this thing. So in 2017, when I first ran it, um, there were zero, uh, professional trail women. There's almost no, sorry, American professional trail women. Um, so I think there was maybe zero American women in the race. So I was one of three American men in the race and there was almost no American women. And, um, Pablo Vigil, who's like this guy, this legend who won the race four times, um, back in the day, he was like, how can we get people to get to this race? And so, uh, um, I don't think I can take credit for this, but I've been telling everyone in the trail community, like, Hey, this is like a really important race. Like if you're sub ultra, you need to check this out. This is a cool race. It's on, uh, the world cup, which is, a um, its own series. And then the, um, golden trail series has adopted it as one of their races too. So it's, it's just kind of one of these races that no matter what you do, if you do shorter races or even longer races, it's, it's on the, the schedule. But to get to the point this year, we had, um, three, let's say it was two women in the top 10. Bailey was sixth, Tabor was 10th. And then I think we had five women in the top 20 or 25. It was insane. So we just like actually came out and crushed. And so the American women just really, really, um, were sh just showing off what we have. And it's cool to have, um, to see that develop and then those athletes to be able to get to these big races abroad. Yeah, I got to get out there. That, that one looks beautiful. But it's, yeah, it's super cool to see the evolution of um, trail running. I did a survey of the listeners of this audience, and it's 55% trail, 45% road as the focus. Some of that is like chicken or egg. Who are the guests? How are, how are we growing? But um, when the pod, this podcast started, it, it would have been probably 70-30. Um, in favor of, of road running. I think that people are realizing that there's the trails are out there and like trails and trail racing is growing. And the, the community is incredible. The, the road running community is awesome, but the trail running community is like next level for sure. Talking about your relationship with community. What is, what does community mean to you? Yeah, I think to, to put on like what you just said, I think that what I first experienced when I came to trail running was that your competitors, because, okay, here's kind of what happens. You're out in the middle of nowhere and it's a small race. It might be a hundred people. And so it's, it's a little different field than, um, which isn't, um, better per se, by the way, but, um, it's different field than running in a 40 or 50,000 person road race. Um, and you would hang out with your competitors after the race and it was great. So I think like, and people were just so welcoming. They're really cool. So I think that, um, that piece of community, like literally being at a trail race and being like, Oh, like one, it's in this cool location to the people who live in that community. Like if you're near a ski resort in New Hampshire, like those people are volunteering, they're there, they care about it and they love it. Um, and then three being able to like, your competitors, those who raced in it, elites, non-elites, um, just coming together to, uh, like have a beer after the race. That was like yeah. the community I really started to feel. Um, so I think that's like the start of what I think about when I think about the, the trail community. I love that. One of my favorite realizations, um, was from my first 
uh, episode with Kara Goucher after she ran uh, Leadville Trail Marathon, and she went into it uh, thinking that she'd win or do really well, and she got her butt handed her, and she said several times it was the hardest thing she'd ever done in her life, including childbirth. Um, which she like reaffirmed several times and then reaffirmed it again, the episode we did this past summer, uh, three years later. Um, and what was really cool about what she said was I got my ass handed to me and I, I expected like she was, she was embarrassed or she, she thought she should be embarrassed given what her perceived expectations were of her. And, she was like, all people cared about was if I had fun and if I enjoyed the snacks that were on the trail and like, they didn't give a shit that she came in six and it was like, Oh, how much fun did you have out there? And meanwhile, she's like sulking that like she didn't win. And she was like, that's when it clicked. That's when I realized like, this is, this is so different. And again, I don't want to disparage road running cause it's, I love road running. I love racing marathons perhaps too much. And, um, it's just, it's such a, it's a different, it's a different vibe. I've said that a million times and people who are listening to this podcast are probably rolling their eyes and saying, okay, we've heard this, <laughs> we heard this over and over, dude, move on. But, um, I just invite anyone who hasn't been to a trail race to go to a trail race. Um, whether it's a 5k, a 10k or do your best to get to a hundred miler one day. And, um, it's just a, it's a wild environment. And then you have these like festival experiences like the rut, like broken arrow, like any of these where it's like three days of, of fun and there are races and beer and pizza and like all this stuff that, um, just makes it more than, more than just running. And I think that's the future. Honestly, these like three day experiences, in a mountain town or at a resort or something like that, where there's some aspect of like an elite folks and prize money, but the, the bulk of people go because of the environment and the, the community feel. Uh, okay. So switching, switching gears uh, a little bit. I am curious about your um, definition. I like asking definitions and like define this. Um, curious your definition of, of success. What what does success mean to you? Hmm. <laughs> um, well, it's funny because I'm thinking like about the trail team a lot right now. <laughs> so I think, man, there's a lot of things going on with that. I think personally, um, and I think success is external and internal. Like you're saying, I think there's like objective goals I want to do as an athlete. There's things where like you're saying there's this yin and yang with road racing and trail racing. And, and those are always part of my life where, um, I want to win races. I want to win the world championships. I've gotten second and third and fifth and I want to win. Um, that's like a successful goal. Um, but then I also think that there's totally a piece for, um, did you have fun, the Kara Goucher thing? And so that's definitely more internal. And if you're so focused on these external rewards or, or things you're missing kind of the point. Um, so kind of along the lines of this team that I've been thinking about night and day for the last month, <laughs> at least five years, um, uh, success is just like, getting the community going, like getting people excited. Um, and I think I've already done that. And so I'm like, this is great. I like, can't lose in terms of, uh, of what I'm doing. And, um, so that's such a different goal, I guess, because it's not about raising X amount of money or having someone win the Olympics or something. It's, it's like just a lot more soft and, um, kind of like a, a feeling. How do you balance the, as you said, the soft definition with you're a professional athlete, you have a contract with a bunch of brands, they probably expect you to perform in some capacity, but fun is the like anchor, right? 
I had a conversation with Aisha Pratlier a couple years ago and she's like, I'm 30 years old and I've been in this, I've been running for 50 years and I wouldn't still be doing it if it weren't fun. And, um, it's cool to see that as the anchor point or I don't know if anchor point is the word, but like North star perhaps. And like, you can't have performance if you're not enjoying it at least over the long run or for the long run. Um, so I'm curious your, your relationship with fun versus like, this is a job and it pays your bills as well. Yeah. Um, well, first off it, it doesn't pay the bills. Um, so which I think has been good for me. Um, I've never had a contract that would, um, pay for me to live and eat food in Boulder at a bare minimum. Um, which I think I, I should be grateful for. Like sometimes you're like, Oh, I wish I had this bigger deal or something, but um, I've basically always worked full time, sometimes many, many jobs at once, still sort of doing that, um, just to make, make life work, um, with running. And I think, so when, yeah, when you're asking this, I read this book is probably, uh, a year ago, I'm going to blank on the name right now, but it was essentially just about intrinsic and extrinsic motivation and how extrinsic motivation, things like money, um, it's not fulfilling, you know, it might get you excited for 10 seconds. You know, if you run a mile, you get a chocolate bar, but, um, it doesn't last. And so to be 34 years old and still racing and, um, doing things that are the hardest things you could possibly do. Like if you're trying to break your PR, sometimes you have to run harder than you've ever run before. You need to be intrinsically motivated. It has to be about some goal that is like deeply meaningful to you. And, um, that's been more clear to me this year than I think ever. And I think like, as you, as I've become an older athlete and someone who's more established in the sport and when I've gotten, um, bigger financial opportunities, it doesn't change anything. And you think it does. It's such a, um, like a fallacy, like a misconception to think that, oh, this is going to be better because of the money. Like, um, this race I did this year, maybe I shouldn't go into too many details, but it was like uh, a road race and I won like some money from it. And I was, it was like the least gratifying race I've ever done. And it was like, I think at the time it had tied the most amount of money I'd ever run one in a race. <laughs> and so it was like, it really reaffirmed like, Oh, this, why would you like, don't do it for the money. Don't do it for other people. You have to do it for yourself. Um, well, it's like process versus outcome and, and the like check-ins of here's a check you won this race or, whatnot like that's a sort of the bumpers on on the side but amelia boone has talked about this at length where she was struggling in the early uh 2010s and 12 13 14 etc where like she felt she must win everything and it was like not fun and incredibly stressful and it was like a moving goalpost. and it was okay i won this race check the box Whew, that was a relief. And now you look at her and the, like the, the joy that she has with the sport, like she's not, maybe she's not running as fast as she was, but she's certainly enjoying it more. Um, and, mm -hmm. and appears on the outside as a more fulfilled person. And there's a lot to that. And, and there's a lot of value in like, being fulfilled versus like it's like it's not fulfilling to do things that aren't fun just to just to check a box right yeah and it's it's interesting because it's like i hear you struggling for words for this too because i think it's hard to find what that means because yeah. like people love that internal challenge like that could be the reward um people like the the pure enjoyment of it like you're saying with fun. Um, but it's different things and it's different for different people. And it's different at two seconds later in a race when you're, um, when you're doing it for the right reasons and you're feeling fulfilled. So, um, yeah. <laughs> and then they're like no better feeling than being completely thrashed and knowing you've yeah. just like emptied the tank and gone to the well and you've done something that you've never done before. So my, my PR marathon uh, in 2019, I posted afterwards, I said, if you want something you've never done, you have to go to a place you've never been. 
And to me, that's like the, that's the point of running, right? Like it's completely meaningless in its, in isolation, right? We're doing this thing that's really hard. What's the point of that? If you can take what you've done and like apply it to other places in life and like take these lessons and you're doing, you know, creating a team to enhance the next generation and make their experience better and help them get through hurdles that, you know, took you two years and help them do it in a month or things like that. Like just like pushing, pushing things forward, pushing things forward, pushing things forward. I feel that with this podcast where I get so many messages from people saying like, it's so cool to hear somebody talking about like the guest is speaking directly to me. The experience that I'm had that they had in, in their go with X, Y, Z is exactly what I'm going through right now. And I don't feel alone, like kind of a thing. And it's so cool to be able to like, take these lessons of doing this in an optional sport. We're choosing discomfort and we're growing from it. And like, to me, that's the whole point. That's why we go to these super dark places. That's why we push our bodies to the limits. And from that day in May, 2019, like I know that I can do hard things and I know that I can like get incredibly uncomfortable, whether that's in a three hour stretch uh, a three month stretch or whatever, whatever it might be. But like, that's, that's the point, at least in my opinion. Yeah, I totally agree. That's, that's a really good, good way to put it. Um, what are you excited about most in 2023 outside the, the trail team? Yeah, man. Um, I think, I don't know why I'm feeling this way. Um, but it's, it's about doing things I haven't done and about community for me. Um, and that keeps on coming up over and over again. So, um, speaking of which you're like, you, everyone should go to a hundred miler. I've never been to a hundred miler in person. Um, and I have a lot of really good friends who I want to crew. So, um, I'm hoping I can crew some of my friends at a, at an ultra this year. Um, that's one of the things I'm most excited about. Uh, another thing I'm most excited about would be, let's see, I'm always excited about racing. I love racing. <laughs> so, um, that's going to be cool, but I'm, I'm really happy with kind of this building phase right now during the winter that maybe a lot of people might be in where you're just like, this is time to put in the hard work and, and go out and freeze yourself in the snow in Canada, for instance, and, and, uh, hope that pays off in the summer. Um, but yeah, I think that's, that's kind of the gist. It's simple, but, um, those two main things, just kind of helping friends who I haven't before and, um, and just getting out, get out and racing again. Cool. And you'll be blown away by the, the experience of a hundred miler. It's, uh, exhausting and, uh, so fulfilling to, to crew someone. Um, a question I asked to everyone that lives in a town like Boulder or Flagstaff or, or whatnot, what is your relationship with, like this comparison trap or do, is it something you struggle with? And um, I did a podcast with Matt Daniels a few years ago and he joked that Boulder average is having a shoe sponsor. And he was like, I've run sub four, but like three dudes on my block have run sub four. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, well, so curious in this, like you, you live in a house of athletes um, mm -hmm. and you, you're in this, we're in this town where like there are so many Olympians, so many professional athletes. Do you think about that at all? Is it something that, um, has, has been challenging for you? Um, I'd say the opposite for my first thought. And that's because like, just for example, I walk in the grocery store in like short shorts and like winter boots <laughs> and, and like go buy my groceries and no one cares. It's awesome. And I like really love that acceptance in Boulder and just being like, yeah, I, I fit in. Like I've always felt like kind of a, like a, whatever the expression is, square peg in a round hole or something. Um, and Boulder is like, oh yeah, I can just be myself. Yeah. You can um, wear athletic clothing anywhere in this town. <laughs> yeah. Especially really short shorts. No one cares. Great. <laughs> Um, but yeah, there's a, a, occasionally I'd say, I remember specifically, like, let's bring it to the roads. Like I've run gate river run the U S uh, 15 K champs eight times. I think I've run it a bunch. And, um, 
I think the first couple of years I was like, Oh, I just want to be the first guy from Colorado. And then you're like, Oh, I'm like the third guy from Boulder. (laughs) (laughs) And so, you know, after the eighth time I'm like, Oh, it's, I guess it's, that's fine. Like I'm the top three from Boulder. That's good. Even though we're in Florida running a U.S. champs. So we can't even narrow it down to the state or you got to go all the way down to the city level. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe like part of your neighborhood, the top guy from North Boulder. (laughs) Um, that's awesome. It's like such a, it's such a humbling experience, I would imagine. Um, but yeah, I love the, like, you can go anywhere in, in spandex or like you can be disgusted and go pick up your bagel from wood grain and just like reek of dirty trails and it's totally normal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I've done that. I've done that so many times coming down from, uh, from Ned, just like, all right, we're, we're getting bagels and we stink. Yeah. <laughs> um, I love that. Um, tell me about a, a time when you experienced a, a failure or something that really didn't go your way. And um, maybe it was like really challenging in that moment, but you, you're better for it. And the reason I ask is like this experience of trying, failing, trying, failing, like it's such a universal experience. And a lot of people feel um, alone or isolated when they, when they don't do something right or don't do what they plan to do because social media is often a highlight reel. And so I love hearing Mm -hmm. about like less than ideal experiences because it normalizes that like, that's not, that's not the normal experience or it is the normal experience. Yeah. No. Yeah. There's a lot of failure. (laughs) There's a lot of, uh, 10 minute miles. Like we're talking about before, you know, there's, you're right. Social media is a highlight reel. So it's so biased. Um, there's a funny story actually really quickly, but, um, I grew up with my grandmother who's deceased now, but when I was in college, she's like, all you do is party. (laughs) I was like, literally I'm like super nerdy and all I do is study, but I would post like one picture on Facebook of me, like going to a party (laughs) and she'd be like, all you do is party. Um, but yeah, I think, man, for me, the last two years have been super challenging. Um, I've been injured dealing with like an Achilles injury. I had to take, uh, from May till September, whatever that is off last year, five months. Um, and kind of the first thing that comes to mind, there's probably a million, but, um, I was obsessed with FKT still am. And especially in 2020, 2021. And so kind of the normal for me is like, Oh, I'd find one, I'd go do it. I'd like not even check out the course. I would just run it as hard as I could and I'd get the FKT. Right. And so like, that was kind of the expectation for a couple of these. And then uh, a couple of them I started hitting. So for example, one was this really cool route called the 10 mile traverse that goes across kind of all the mountains in Breckenridge. Um, so across Absolutely the climb. Stunning. Yeah, it's awesome. And it's, it's nuts. Cause you just start at the bottom, you go up 3000 feet and you just traverse this ridge line That is all the, the ski area of, of Breckenridge. And then you off trail straight down the ski, ski slopes to, uh, to the town. Um, so, and it's, it's not short. I think I can't remember the distance and, and stuff like on it. 20 miles, takes, right? Yeah. It takes like three and a half, four hours, something like that ballpark. Um, so the first time I did that, I, I started running down what I thought was the trail, but was actually the Colorado trail, um, <laughs> which is, it's not the ridge line like that you're supposed to be on. And so I think I went down like a mile downhill when I was in the middle of this ridge. <laughs> and so <laughs> I turned around and I was like, Oh no. And you know, you just got to like tell yourself like, Oh, I'm in the middle of this like race thing, FKT. And so I'm walking back up the hill. And basically knew I blew it. I was like, I can't waste, you can't waste 15 minutes or whatever that is on, um, which it was way longer than that. Just probably, you know, fast mile down and then a 20 minute mile up the mountain. Um, so yeah, that was hard, but I think like the point was, so I did the whole, the whole, uh, point to point missed the time by 20 minutes (laughs) and was like, well, that was dumb. I, all I did was this wrong turn. Um, and I came back a month later and even though it's, four hour run. I did it again and I got the time. Um, and so like, that's like a easy success story because it only took two tries, but for me, <laughs> like mentally saying, Hey, I'm going to come back and run this four hour, really hard thing that I just gave my best effort on. Um, and I just blew it cause I took a wrong turn. Um, 
it's like, it is hard, right? Like you go and you're like, you got to be psyched to do it. Um, and so it's cool because it's a success story because I came back and got the time. But I did that over and over and over and over again the last two years, basically. <laughs> so um, specifically, like, again, what's coming to mind is I think I did that with like three or four different FKTs where I got took a wrong turn. And you're just like, oh, my gosh, I'm like running as hard as I could down a hill. And I just blew it. And you're like <laughs> that one second of like, miss, you know, where like a bug hit your eye, then you're like going down the road. Oh. Yeah, this one... Um, it's called High Lonesome Loop. Have you ever run that? It's near Boulder. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's beautiful. Um, first time I did that, I like somehow just ended up, this is like trail running. Um, all of a sudden I was running down a waterfall and I was like, that, that's not a trail. <laughs> I thought it was the trail. <laughs> it's like the trail was flooded or something. And so I was just like, oh yeah, this looks right. And all of a sudden I'm like, oh, it's getting like really steep and it's rocky. And I just dropped down like 300 feet and that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> so, Where is there a waterfall on that route? Uh, it's on Kings Lake Trail on the way back. I don't know. If you use hit if it, you'll know it. Counter, there's a nice little stream. Uh, if you're going counterclockwise, there's a nice stream crossing that's like probably 75% of the way in. And um, in the summer, it oh. looks... It's funny because you, you cross the... It's kind of hard to explain, but you cross the river and you pro, you got to go like a little left. And the, the river kind of goes a little right. And so it's like... It looks like either uh, makes uh, sense... Uh, um, yeah. And for some reason, you're like, oh, I'll just run along the side of this. It's probably like a little picnic trail that someone made like alongside the river. Um, I thought you were going to say you ended up like in Winter Park or something. Like on, no, not, on the other not side. quite. That would have been bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but I think, I mean, those are just like really specific FKT examples where you get lost or something. But um, like everything that's worthwhile is challenging. And everything that's worthwhile takes... 150 mistakes to get it right one time and that one time is really special and magical but there's a lot of you know there's 140 less exciting things um and that's what you're saying with like pros running 10 minute miles or um you know the workouts that don't you don't hit over and over again like uh here's one more quick story um and this is funny because i i do like strength training with jake riley Olympian marathoner Jake Riley, who's really fast. And uh, I just told him this story and he was like, oh, I don't remember that. And it makes him look bad, but he was joking. We were laughing about it. But I was getting ready for Houston half marathon, like this time of year, several years ago. And I was coming off a of trail season. I was like super tired. I'd only been running slow on trails relatively, like no, you know, no four forty miles or whatever I'm supposed to be running at Houston. And um Jake and I were both on the track in Boulder and I was like, Jake, super psyched. I just finished this workout. I just did three by a mile at five flat. Like I'm ready for Houston. And he's like, there's no way you're going to run one Oh five, like five flat at Houston. <laughs> if you just ran the pace for three miles with breaks in between, <laughs> <laughs> he's like, there's no way. And I was like, Oh, <laughs> I was like my indicator. I'm ready. I have like two weeks. I'm ready to go. Um, this wasn't that long ago and I, I ran one Oh five, but, uh, <laughs> it was just really funny. Cause it's like, yeah, like you got to take the little victories and, and not everything's just like this, you know, 20 miles at pace where you're like, of course I'm going to do it. Like sometimes you got to have confidence and you got to know that, um, little successes will get you there. <laughs> totally. And yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, I think that's a good place to wrap today. Um, so for those who don't follow you or they're tuning in and they're, they're learning about your team, uh, where can, where can find you? Yeah. Find me on Instagram at the underscore trail underscore team. Um, or I'm at Wacker a, um, W A C K E R A. Um, and those are good places to start. So thanks for listening. Awesome. And, uh, whether it's at a, at a soft hour here in Boulder or, or a trail in Tahoe, uh, looking forward to sharing some more miles with you soon. Sounds great. Thanks for having me. Of course.